Okay, so let me go ahead and begin today's lecture. Uh, so you remember, so here's the main theorem that I want to prove today, uh, which is that if you have two, if you have a group gamma and it's properly proximal with respect to two boundary pieces x1 and x2, then it is properly proximal uh, with respect to the union x1 union x2. And in particular, uh, this means that SLNR, since it can be written as a finite, we have finitely many boundary pieces, and we know that SL or any lattice in SLNR is properly proximal with respect to finitely many boundary pieces whose union give us all of the stone check magnification. Uh, so we know that uh, as a corollary of this theorem, we get that lattices in SLNR are properly proximal. And as another corollary, we get that uh, proper proximality is closed under taking finitely many direct products. And that's again, because uh, if we take a direct product of properly proximal things, then we get two natural boundary pieces, uh, which cover the whole stone check magnification and, uh, and more properly proximal with respect to each one. Uh, okay, so this is the significance of, of this theorem. Uh, so to prove this theorem, this theorem is going to use uh, a lemma, which, which was uh, shown to us by Ozawa. So here's the key lemma to prove this theorem. And that is that, uh, so, uh, so the following, so I should say everything here, gamma is a countable group. Uh, so gamma here, gamma a countable group. The following are equivalent. Oh, and we have a boundary piece, x a boundary piece, x a boundary piece. So then the following are equivalent. So one is that gamma is properly proximal relative to x, which let me recall, so a boundary piece, remember, was just a closed subset of the stone check magnification take away the group, uh, which was invariant under both left and right multiplication, uh, and properly proximal relative to x, uh, rem remember that this just means uh, there does not exist a left uh, gamma invariant state on L infinity of gamma quotient out by this ideal of functions which vanish at x. So X is a subset of the stone check magnification, so we can consider the ideal of functions which vanish on X. Uh, and this gives us some ideal in L infinity of gamma. And this is a, this ideal is invariant under both left and right multiplication because X is, is invariant under left and right multiplication. And so then we look at the right invariant functions on this quotient, quotient space. Uh, and then two is, they're going to be a very similar characterization. There does not exist a left gamma invariant state on, but now we're just going to take the double dual, L infinity of gamma I naught X. We're going to take the double dual of this. So this is C star algebra. We've taken as double dual and we again have an action of the group on left and right uh, here. And so we can look at the right invariant uh, elements here. And again, the group gamma X on the left. So this is the, the state. Uh, so first, so this is the key lemma we'll prove. So first of all, why does the theorem, proof of the theorem from the lemma Uh, and this is just because uh, if we have two boundary pieces, so the, the issue is, is, that, um, uh, is that the boundary pieces, so these are closed subsets, uh, 
yeah, so what, what am I trying to say? Uh, these are closed subsets of the stone check compactification, uh, but they are not necessarily open subsets. So you can't just uh, say if you have, um, uh, what you would like to do is suppose you have some, some state on the union and you would like to restrict it to one or the other. But this is not necessarily possible uh, to contradict the proper proximality. So, but this is not necessarily possible because these are not open subsets, so this quotient doesn't embed naturally. But when you go to the double dual, this is analogous to taking Borel functions rather than continuous functions. And so here then you can take the characteristic functions and restrict uh, the state. Uh, so that's the idea of the proof of the lemma. Uh, so specifically, what, what do you have? You have, um, so if you take x1, so if x1 is a boundary piece, So then we have an embedding, a natural embedding of L infinity of gamma modulo uh, I naught of X1. And this embeds, um, we want to embed it into L infinity of gamma modulo I not x1 union x2 um, of the right invariant here. But this doesn't necessarily embed. So that how you'd want to do it is you'd want to say, let's take a function in here. So we view this function, so this is some function, right? Everything here we can view as the stone check compactification. Uh, so f, a function in this quotient space is, remember, this is continuous function on the stone check compactification such that f restricted to x1 is equal to zero. So that's what this space gives you. Uh, and then you would like to say, uh, what am I saying here? Uh, and it's invariant under right translation. And so you would like to say, Yeah, so if you have, I'm not saying this very well, I didn't prepare my notes properly for this. Um, Uh, okay, so th this is fine, I think, what I'm saying here. So this, we think of these as the functions which vanish on x1. And so this over here, we think of these as the functions which vanish on the union. And so we have this natural, we do have this natural embedding here. That's no problem. Uh, so that's what we get there. The issue is that this is not a, a unital embedding here. One question, wouldn't the embedding be the other way around? Uh, yeah, that's why I'm a bit confused here. 
right, so I want to. I mean, if a function uh, is zero in x one, unit in x two, then it's zero in x one, right? <laughs> Uh, hold on here. Uh, I want to view this more as a quotient. Uh, hold on, this is. These are one of these things that make perfect sense when you're reviewing them for your notes, but then when you think, how do I explain this, uh, when you're actually sitting down, uh, it becomes a bit muddled. Uh, so the idea is I want to view So if I have a state here, which is invariant, uh, so then I want to get, I want to think of this as, so of course this is, uh, you know, what is this? So this space right here, that's, ah, no, of course that's what I mean. So the ideal, so what I was writing was the ideal, not the quotient. So that's where the confusion comes from. So the ideal are functions which vanish on x1, x2. So this space, the quotient space, we identify with continuous functions on x1, x2. So this is isomorphic to continuous functions on x1 union x2. So we're looking at, and then we're looking at this rate. So we're looking at right invariant functions, uh, continuous functions on x1 and x2, and we're supposing we have a state here. So this gives us a probability measure, right? So if, uh, so if, maybe let me state it like this because I'm not stating the inclusion right. So oh, wait, I don't want to erase the whole thing. So what do we have? We do have this natural isomorphism here. So therefore, if gamma is not properly proximal relative to x1 union x2, so what does that give us? That gives us a uh, probability measure on, um, so we have here this, so we have a probability measure on Yeah, so we have a probability measure on this space here, such that uh, it's invariant under the left, left multiplication. Uh, but here's, here's the key thing here, is that uh, we can look at continuous functions on x1. Yeah, so if x, this is what I need to say. If x is not properly proximal relative to x1 and x2, then we obtain a uh, probability measure, oops, we obtain a probability measure on x1 union x2. Uh, sure, by extending this to a probability measure, uh, such that on the, when we restrict to the continuous functions, which are right invariant, this probability measure becomes invariant, right? So what we can do, so what do I mean to say? So here we have this, therefore we have some state on this. We can extend this and extend this state to continuous functions on x1 union x2. 
uh, such that Uh, so we have a state on this, uh, but here's here's the trick. So the issue is is that we we can extend this to a state on x one union x two, uh, but um, uh, the whole point is that the right equivariance uh, we can't split as an x one and x two x two. So specifically, if there, if you have a continuous function on x1, or specifically if you have a continuous function on x1 union x2, that's right equivariant, uh, you can't just like say restrict it to a continuous function on x, x1, which is right equivariant. Um, or other way around, if you have, sorry, if you have a continuous function on x1, which is right invariant, then there's no reason to expect that you can extend it to a continuous function on the union, which is right invariant. However, if you have a Borel function on X1, which is right invariant, then you can extend it to a Borel function on the union, which is right invariant, because you just let, let it be zero off of the set X1. And this is, this is the whole point. So what we can do here is here we have this, uh, we have an embed. So if X1 is a boundary piece, X1 and X2 uh, are boundary pieces. Boundary pieces. So then we have an isomorphism. We have an isomorphism like this. And therefore this gives us an embedding, and that's the key point. We therefore, get an embedding of Borel functions, bounded Borel functions from x1 union x2, gamma r, right, invariant Borel functions into the double dual of this. Right, because Borel functions live in the double dual of continuous functions. Uh, so we get this embedding right here. So now if we have a state here, now we can pull it back and get a state here. However, we have this, uh, now we do have this isomorphism. We know, it, we, so if, so if gamma is not properly proximal, relative to x1 union x2. So then there exists a gamma invariant state on this space of Borel functions. X2, gamma r. But now what, what we can do here is now we can just restrict this to the characteristic function of x1 or restrict it to the characteristic function of x2. And then we have this uh, using the fact that they are right invariant. And we have that this therefore is isomorphic to a direct sum of infinite Borel functions. Direct sum bounded Borel functions x2. And so since we have a state here, uh, we see, well, I guess it's not necessarily a direct sum if, there, if there's some overlap, but uh, what do we see? Um, what do we see is that we have this natural em embedding. And that's the whole point. We have this natural embedding of Borel functions, right invariant Borel functions naturally embedding here and this is just by taking some f and sending it to a new function, which is just f, you know, do you just define f to be zero on the complement of x? So f tilde or f tilde um, 
of omega is zero for omega and not an x one. So this then says, well, if we have a invariant state here, then by restriction, we get an invariant positive linear functional here. However, this positive linear functional could be zero, except that since x1 union x2 is, is equal to the whole space, it can't be zero for both x1 and x2. So since the characteristic function on x1 uh, plus the characteristic function on x2 is greater than or equal to the characteristic function on x1 union x2, we have um, that uh, if there's probably there, I'll give the state a name, we have that phi of one of these is non zero. It's non zero or phi of x2 is non zero. And so that shows that either uh, we're not properly proximal with respect to x1 or we're not properly proximal with respect to x2. All right. So sorry about that. That was a little bit muddled, uh, but hopefully you can see the details in here. But the whole idea is that for continuous functions, we kind of do this because you can't just say, if you have a continuous function uh, on x1, you can't just say extend it to a continuous function on x1 union x2. Right? But for a Borel function, you can. And so that's why passing to the double dual uh, somehow saves us. Okay, so this is the key lemma now that I want to prove. Uh, so again, that uh, I want to show that if there doesn't exist a state on this space, then there doesn't exist a state on the double dual, um, on the right invariant functions of the double dual. All right, so that's the goal. And this is a little bit of a technical argument, but uh, hopefully I can convey the intuition without too much difficulty. Uh, to do this, we're going to need one uh, lemma from C stern algebras. And that's the following. So suppose, so suppose X is a boundary piece. And this also addresses the question at the beginning of, lec of the lecture. Suppose X is a boundary piece uh, and I not of X in L infinity of gamma, the corresponding ideal. So then there exists an approximate identity for I naught X. Uh, let's give it a name, let's call it alpha I, such that alpha I is uh, increasing. So zero, they're all between zero and one. They're increasing uh, and they're almost invariant under both left and right uh, translation. And RT alpha I minus alpha I and norm goes to zero for all T and gamma and same with the left translation. Uh, so this is the lemma. So there's a general, so let me give you the proof, the proof of this. And this is a result which I believe was first due to Arvison. Um, so there's a general construction for an approximate identity uh, whenever you have an ideal in a C star algebra, uh, which you can make to be an increasing approximate identity. So I'll take that for granted. You can look in any C star algebra book to find that. It's just these extra conditions here, uh, you know, that I want to give a proof of. So, uh, so what we do is we take any, uh, say, increasing 
approximate identity. Let me give it a different name. How about beta i um, for the ideal? So, and like I said, that exists for any ideal in a C star algebra, and you can look in any book and operator algebras and, and find a, a easy construction of such a thing. Uh, so what do we do from this? Well, consider the double dual of L infinity. Uh, so this is going to be L infinity double dual, and we're going to have the double dual of the identity of the ideal sitting inside here. Side of L infinity double dual. Now the double dual of a C star algebra is some monstrous, you know, non-separable, highly non-separable. I mean, here even L infinity itself is already non-separable as a C star algebra. So this is some some monster. Uh, but the important thing to know is that it is isomorphic to a von Neumann algebra. So and the double dual of an ideal is then going to be a weak star closed ideal in a von Neumann algebra. So this inclusion, so I naught x double dual is a weak star or ultra weak closed ideal in a von Neumann algebra. And there's a nice classification of uh, of two-sided closed ideals in a von Neumann algebra, they're all just the cutdown of the von Neumann algebra by a projection, a central projection. So we get that therefore there exists a central projection. Well, this is an abelian von Neumann algebra, so that's the central is not such a central projection. P uh, such that I naught of X double star uh, is equal. Ah, hold on. I want to do this even in a larger one I'm out for because I want to consider sorry. Um, I want to consider the double dual of the cross product. So it won't be a BA. So I not uh, this. So gamma times gamma. Double dual sitting inside of L infinity of gamma cross gamma times gamma, double dual, where the two copies of gamma, one acts by left translation, the other acts by right translation. So we take an approximate identity beta for I naught, we consider this, and then this, what I've drawn here, this first part, let me call this, let me call this A. So we have that A double dual is a weak star closed ideal in this von Neumann algebra. And we call the von Neumann algebra B, well, the C star algebra B, so that's von Neumann algebra is B double dual. All right, so then there exists a central projection P such that uh, this double dual is just exactly the cutdown of the double dual of B by this projection. So B double dual is a sum of von Neumann algebra, and this is a central projection uh, P in, so it's central in B in the double dual. So this is in the center of B double dual. All right. Uh, so now what does this, uh, tell us, this tells us in particular that if we take, say, one of the copies of gamma, um, so therefore, uh, hold on, there's still something I'm not happy with. Yeah, I wanted to take a, sorry to keep no cha changing the no notation here, but a I did want to be I naught. So, a is I naught, and this is in the cross product here. A I naught, 
Yes. Uh, hold on. This is an ideal in here. This, that's an ideal in L infinity. No. Sorry about that. I'm a bit scatterbrained today. So I had it right before. So I want to consider just this situation and we have this situation. Uh, okay, but now what's what's the point is now we can consider this all of this as sitting inside. So gamma acts on both of these by left and right. So we can now consider a double star as uh, sitting inside of P B double star, and this should all sit inside of B double star cross gamma times gamma. Uh, which is a von Neumann algebra. So this is the von Neumann cross product. And now the thing to notice here is that this projection P is, uh, because this I, this ideal I is invariant under the group action, uh, so this projection P is going to be gamma invariant under the action of gamma here. So what do we get? We get that L, uh, LT of P is equal to RT of P is equal to P, and this is for all uh, T and gamma. So the two copies of gamma, they both fix this projection P. All right, so what does that mean? The other thing we know is we know even how to find this projection P, that is when you have uh, your von Neumann algebra here, because we know that these beta i's is an approximate identity, so it's going to converge to the identity uh, in the double dual. So we have, in fact, that what is P? P is, in fact, the weak ultra weak limit, so the weak operator topology limit or strong operator topology limit of the, the sequence beta i. So this is the weak operator topology limit in the double dual. So what does that mean? So that means therefore, if we look at LT of beta i minus beta i, well, this converges to zero in the weak operator topology. And similarly, RT beta i minus beta i converges to zero in the weak operator topology. Oh, excuse me for interrupting. Is it yes. alpha i? Uh, no, this is beta. So we started with an ar arbitrary, so we started to take any increasing approximate identity. We're going to construct the alpha i. Oh, oh It'll so be different from this beta, right? Okay. Uh, but here's the, the point is that this beta, so you take any increasing approximate identity for i naught, and we have this condition that uh, that we in the double dual we get weak operator topology convergence of this difference. But now what can we do? Well, now this formula here, these two formulas, we can also take convex combinations. So that's exactly what we do. So we take by taking convex combinations or taking the convex whole. of these beta i's, we can ensure that, uh, well, this, now we have a convex combination uh, which converges weak operator topology. So by taking the convex combinations, we can ensure that this converges in actual norm. So by taking convex combinations, Uh, we can ensure that alpha i, so this is going to be some convex combination. So it's going to be in the convex whole of these beta, uh, beta j's, uh, so that this converges. So this holds a norm. So that we can ensure that this then lt of alpha i means alpha i in the norm to zero and RT alpha I minus alpha I in the norm. 
right? This is because of the Han Vanak theorem, because we know that the weak operator topology, so these are bounded sets, so weak operator topology is the same as the weak star topology in a von Neumann algebra. And, uh, and, then, by, um, and then by Han Vanak, you have a convex uh, weak star closed subset. Uh, if it contains zero, then it then already in the norm closed convex hole contains zero. And so that's the Han Vanak separation theorem. Uh, so this is allow how we choose the allies. Now I'm, I'm, you know, maybe should make this more precise, meaning that for every finitely many elements of alpha i, there's some, uh, or for every finitely many elements of i naught, there's some j such that beta is an approximate identity for those elements beyond that j. And so here I just take alpha i to be in the convex of the beta j's beyond that j such that this ha also happens in our favorite finite set. And then of course, you can always take alpha i's to be increasing because you know the beta j's are increasing. So there's some details about how to get these alpha i's, but this is, uh, this is the basic idea. Um, uh, but to do this properly, you would define an, this alpha i would be some net indexed over the finite subsets of i naught plus the finite subsets of gamma and, and you do it in this way. All right, so I'm being a little bit uh, imprecise about the actual construction of the alpha i's, but hopefully this conveys the idea. The main idea is that uh, by passing the double dual, you use that you have this uh, identification of, of ideals, weak star closed ideals in von Neumann algebras. They're all cut downs by projection. And then you have weak operator topology convergence, and hence you can replace that to norm convergence. So this is the idea. All right, uh, this can be done in a more general situation of any ideal in a C star algebra. Uh, you can get, this is called a quasi-central approximate identity. Um, so basically you, you can get an idea, you can get an approximate identity for the ideal, um, which, uh, which asymptotically commutes with any element in the C star algebra. So that's all we're doing. Okay, so that's the lemma I need. Uh, and now let's go ahead and prove uh, this main theorem. So here's the proof, the proof of the main lemma. So proof of the lemma that uh, L infinity of gamma mod I naught X by gamma R does not have invariant state if and only if the same is true when we place this gamma mod x double dual gamma r doesn't. All right, so let's go ahead and prove this lemma. Uh, so one direction is easy to prove because, of course, this uh, C star algebra here naturally embeds uh, uh, Sorry, so if we have a state here, if we have a state here, then of course, we'll actually by taking the double dual, we get a normal state here. If we have an, if we have an invariance, uh, we, if we have an invariant, no, 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 other way around. If we have an invariant state here, yeah, we have a natural embedding of this into this. So if we have an invariant state here, then we can restrict to an invariant state here, right? So that's what we have. So note, we have a natural embedding. Natural embeds. Yeah, we certainly have this, and this is a unital embedding. So if we have a state on the right, then we can restrict to a state on the left. If we have a, a gamma invariant state on the right, we restrict to a gamma invariant state on the left. So we just need to prove the other, other way, so that if we don't have a gamma invariant state on the right, then we don't have a gamma invariant state on the left. 
And so how we're going to prove that is we're going to use a paradoxical decomposition uh, characterization of, of the packs that we don't have a gamma invariant state. So similar like we did with non-immutability. And we'll show that this paradoxical decomposition on the right will be able to allow us to get a paradoxical decomposition on the left. So this is the idea. So suppose, uh, so, so suppose there does not exist a gamma invariant state on the right situation. That's not right. Um, so like I said, that means that, uh, so this is a general Han Bonnach type argument. Uh, well, so then there does not exist any non-zero, uh, you know, left gamma invariant linear functional. Uh, why is that? That's because if there was any, if there was some non-zero left gamma invariant linear functional, then we could uh, take its real and imaginary parts, which would both be gamma invariant, and one of which would at least be non-zero. And then on the real or imaginary parts, we could take the Hahn decomposition, its positive and negative parts. And uh, since this is a nice C-star algebra here, it has unique Hahn decomposition. And so then you get that um, one of these is non-zero and will be a positive invariant, gamma invariant um, linear function. So if we don't have any positive, if we don't have any states, gamma invariant states, then there are no gamma invariant linear functionals whatsoever, except for the zero one. Uh, but this is a setting, you know, ideal for Han Banach. So by Han Banach, this means that if we consider this space here, so if we consider the uh, span of the set of all things which are of the form F minus left translation by F, and this is for T and gamma, and F in this uh, C star algebra. So by Han Bonnach, this means that this is norm dense. Uh, dense. In, uh, in the C star algebra is norm dense. Right, because if it wasn't norm dense, then we could take its closure and by the Han Banach theorem, we could find a linear functional which was zero on the closure but non zero on the whole space. Uh, but being zero on the closure of this exactly says that it's left invariant. And so you would have a non-zero left invariant linear functional if that were possible. So by the Han Bonnach theorem, this has to be dense since there does not exist any non-zero left invariant linear functional. Uh, so in particular, this means that we can approximate the constant one function in here. So therefore, there exists some f1, f2, up to, say, fn, and there exists t1. So these are all in L infinity of gamma mod i naught of x double dual, uh, right invariant, and then there exists t1 up to tn and gamma, such that the sum of f i minus l t i f uh, and norm is very close to one. So one, the constant one function minus this is say less than one half and norm. Okay, so we have this sort of paradoxical decomposition. 
But now we're, what we'll do is we'll take this paradoxical decomposition and these FIs, which live in this space, we're going to create new ones which live in this space. So this is the goal. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that, of course, this is in the double dual. And in the double dual, we, we can approximate things weakly by things in the original space. So um, we can choose nets. Uh, G, uh, let me, I want to use I for the net, so let me change this I here to a K. So let's choose nets uh, G, K, I. So these are going to be in L infinity of gamma mod I naught, such that uh, these G, K, I's converge as i tends to infinity to f k uh, ultra weakly or weak star. And I want that they're norm bounded by okay. This is the fact that the uniball is weak star dense in the double dual. This is Goldstein's theorem. Um, classic result in functional analysis. So we just choose things which approximate, uh, which approximate this. Uh, so there's some issues here now though, in that, um, you know, I don't know if this estimate actually holds, uh, and I don't know if the GK's eyes are right invariant. So these are the issues. Uh, so we'll also choose to get this condition to hold, we'll also choose an approximation for this finite uh, sum here. So also choose some net bi. Uh, so these are going to be in, in L infinity of gamma mod x, uh, such that uh, bi minus the sum k uh, or gk. So I want to say such that would be the I converge to the sum F K minus L T K F K uh, we could weak star. So this is some finite sum for K one to three. And again, such that they're norm uniformly bounded. Uh, uniform. I say the norm of this thing. Uh, and then what do we know? We know that uh, um, let me stick with my notes so I don't get too uh, track. Uh, actually, let me go ahead and uh, throw in the one, one minus here, and then I'll then say bi less than or equal to one half to make it more precise. Okay, so now what we're going to do? So now we've have approximations in the original space, but now we need to make everything right invariant. So this is the issue. And to make everything right invariant, we're going to have to um, uh, choose even lips of all of these. So uh, to try to save notation, uh, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to denote by G, I, K, the actual lifts to L infinity. So these are going to actually live in L infinity. And so when I say the quotient here, I want that G, I, K plus I naught of X. When I view them in the quotient, I want them to converge weak star. And same with the B, I's. I want them to be in L infinity such that B, I, when I take them in the quotient space, they converge weak star. 
All right, so now, like I said, the issue is that if we look at these in the quotient space, they may not be right invariant. So that's the issue. So I want to alter them to force them to be right invariant. And so what I'm going to do that is I'm going to uh, enumerate, so write gamma as the union of finite sets, uh, BN finite. And let's choose, um, uh, and what do we know? We know that in the limit, they are right uh, invariant. And so note that for all T and gamma, we have uh, R I K uh, No, I think I'm confusing. Uh, I didn't want to take the quotient, uh, so I want to take GI choose nets. Oh, sorry about this. I'm going to need both notations. So I'm going to choose GI such that this is the case. Uh, I am going to choose the lifts and I'm going to choose HI to be the lifts of GI. So choose, uh, well, before I choose the HI, I want to uh, give one consequence. Uh, so the GKs, in fact, before I even choose the B, sorry about that. Um, so we choose the GKIs such that they converge weak star to FI. And the observation I want to make before I move on, so note that if we look at GKI minus right translation by T of GKI, so this converges weak star to FK minus right translation by T of FK which is zero, and that's weak star. That's, this is the observation I wanna make, which means uh, just like we did in the last lemma, if we take convex combinations of these, then we can actually get norm convergence. And notice that taking convex combinations doesn't change the fact that we converge to FK. So therefore, what can we do? So therefore, by taking convex combinations, of GKI, we may assume that this convergence is a norm. We may assume that GKI minus right translation by T, GKI, the norm converges to zero as I tends to infinity. And this is for each T and gamma. So by taking since they converge to zero weak star, again, taking convex combinations, we can converge to zero. And taking convex combinations does not affect this norm estimate here. And it does not affect the fact that we converge weak star to FK. Since if the GIs do, then so does any convex combination that we want to take. So this gives us an extra assumption here that this convergence is in norm. So now I want to take lifts. Now take lifts. H, I, K, which are an L infinity of um, gamma of G, I, K, and take uh, a lift uh, B, I, and L infinity gamma of one minus the sum uh, over K of G, K, I minus right translation by T, K of GK. 
All right, so my lifts that live in L infinity are H, K, I, and V, K, I. And so we're going to, yeah, the whole point was that the GKs were not right invariant, but in asymptotically, they become right invariant in this sense. And so now we're going to take lifts and alter these lifts slightly such that they project again down to things which, which give us what we want. So this is the idea. All right, so now we're going to take this approximate identity. So now take alpha. Uh, and now since the other thing I should remark here is since now we have just a, a sequence, uh, so we're taking, uh, so we're just going to choose sequences. So we've enumerated the group uh, gamma. So gamma is a union of Bn. So enumerate Uh, gamma is a union of Bn, since gamma is countable. And so then we can choose a, an approximate identity. Identity alpha n, and going from 1 to infinity for this ideal. So I think in the case where it's actual proxy, properly proximal and then these alpha n's are just C0 uh, functions. Uh, so we have an approximate identity for this uh, such that we have the following uh, thing. So such that uh, for every uh, n, uh, we can choose some i of n such that when we look at these HKIN minus right translation by T of HKIN. So we want this to be say less than two to the minus uh, N. And this is for all T in the N nth ball here. Uh, and we also want that the alpha n's, uh, so, so we're going to choose these hn, then we're going to choose these alpha n's such that they go to one, uh, so they're approximate identity, uh, and they satisfy these conditions. So I have here that one minus alpha n, when we apply this to gk or hk, hk i n minus right translation by T H K I N. So we want that this is less than two to the minus N. So this is possible just because we see that these are, uh, the difference here is a norm uh, very small here. So we can, um, so we can certainly by taking alpha N large enough, we know that this can be as an approximate identity, and this is in uh, uh, this is in our space, so we can take. What am I saying? This is uh, uh, this is some obvious. Uh, Yeah, this is just not saying anything because this number is between zero and one. So we're not saying anything here. Uh, but the other thing I want is that alpha n minus right translation by T of alpha n. So this should be less than two to the minus n for T n this ball. And so let's, let's number these things. So the other thing that I'm going to want is I'm going to want one minus alpha n uh, b i n minus the sum over k of h i n k minus left translation by t k of h i n k. So I want that this is less than two to the n minus n. Uh, and 
the fourth condition I want is that alpha n minus LT alpha n is less than two to the minus C. Professor, so all of these inequalities are for T in BN, right? Uh, yes, for all, these are all for all T and BN. Uh, quick question. Yes. Why, why didn't you have the, the approximate identity as a sequence? Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm choosing, I'm choosing, so I should have chose the approximate identity after this. So that should be right there. So I'm choosing the sequence uh, I sub N based on the H case. I'm choosing them such that this happens, right? So we know, we know that this, this happens. So this gets less than any epsilon. So there's therefore for each N, I can choose some element in this net I N such that this happens. Mm -hmm. But now what we have is now we have a sequence of elements. So I need, I have this approximate identity, which is a net, but I only want it to be approximate identity for a sequence, specifically this sequence of elements. And mm -hmm. for each N, we have these HKINs, and we also have this sequence here, gamma is countable. So therefore I need this approximate identity only to be an approximate identity for this sequence. And because we're looking at only this approximate identity on a sequence, we can turn the approximate, approximate identity itself into a sequence. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. So yeah, I should have chose this sequence here first, and then that allows us to choose the alpha ends as a sequence. So in a way, it's like looking at the C star algebra generated by the sequence. That's yeah, you restrict, you restrict okay. the C star algebra generated by the sequence. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the, this is why I can take the alpha ends to be an actual increasing sequence here. Uh, so fact, then. Uh, I'm sorry, contracting, but why? we can have three condition third. Uh, so the third condition, what is this? So let's go back to how were this BN chosen. So BN I chose uh, or lifts of this, of this sequence here. And uh, this sequence we also knew, uh, so the BNs were lift, lifts of this, and this converged to the same thing with the FIs. So as GK tend to infinity, these tend to, the FIs, uh, and so what do we know? We know that BI of, of this minus uh, the G, or the HKs, or the GIs, sorry, BI minus the H, the GIs, this, um, hold on, we know that the GIs, this is another con convexity of the, uh, hold on. No, no, that, that's just because um, the BIs are lifts. So in the quotient, we have, uh, when we look at the quotient, we have that the BIs are the same as this GIs, so the, which is the same as the HIs in the quotient, right? So this whole thing in the quotient is equal to zero. Uh, so we took lifts of zero here. So that means that this whole element here so this element here lives in the ideal. So is it a RTN, not LTN? This, this is in the ideal I not of X, right? And it's the same thing here. This is in the ideal I not of X, right? Because the HKs were lifts of the GKs and the GKs were chosen such that this converges in normal zero, or I guess, uh, it's not, uh, so it's this plus something of small norm. So plus uh, some, some something of norm less than two to the minus n, right? Because we chose this, uh, actually this one is already of norm less than two to the minus n. So this one's fine, but this one, it's because they're in the ideal. Is that clear? Because we chose bi to be lifts of this thing and we chose the HI to be lifts of the GIs individually. So everything in the quotient pushes to the same thing. 
right? So that this, when we push it in the quotient, this is just uh, zero. Oh, may, maybe so, sorry. There should probably be a one here, maybe. Um, and also, uh, HK minus RT, HK. Uh, HK minus RT. No, HK minus RT, we can do this just because I'm not saying anything. Just because we chose the HK minus RTs to satisfy this. Oh. So this is not saying anything, right? Okay. Um, and this is because they're approximately right invariant. This is because it's approximately less invariant. In condition three, it's because uh, this should be in the ideal. And since I chose B a lift of this, um, uh, my only concern is why I would have gone differently in my notes. Uh, yeah, let me, I think B should just be a lift of this and then that's clear. Okay. All right, so now, now that should be clear. Thank you. Okay, so th these, this is the situation we have. Uh, so now what can we do? Let's go ahead and define new elements. So we're going to go, we're going to define um, uh, HK, uh, yes, I don't think we've used that. So we're going to define HK. So these are going to be NL infinity and these are going to be defined by uh, hk is just equal to the sum over n of alpha n plus one minus alpha n times hk i n. And we're also going to define b, so hk and b by this alpha one plus the sum uh, for n greater than or equal to one of alpha n plus one minus alpha n B I N. All right, so these are in L infinity. This is in L infinity. And then what's the thing to notice now? So you notice what, what happened was is that, so the BNs, the BINs, um, uh, the error term, we kind of shifted it by one. So we throw in this first term here, which is just some, some, thing, some elements in the ideal, which we don't care about. And then by our choices of the alpha Ns, we can make this part very small. Uh, and then for the HKs, uh, we didn't throw away the first part, but we just took them uh, by this so that this, this will again be a good approximation. Uh, and then finally, uh, yeah, since everything since this is almost invariant for right translation, and these are almost invariant left, everything should, should work, right? So the point is that this is an L infinity, and now we just do a computation. So the first thing to note, is that b minus one is less than one half in in norm, uh, and uh, why is that? That's just because uh, each of these bi's uh, um, yeah, that's just because if you put in one, the fact that this is an approximate identity, and I've I've taken the alternating sums here, you get a telescoping sum. And so um, uh, this, this follows from the fact that each of the BINs, where are they? BINs, uh, somewhere here, the BINs in norm are less than one half. So these are the BINs. Oh, so I should have taken one minus this and I should put in a one minus here. Sorry about that. So that the BINs are less than one half away from one. Okay. Uh, then the other thing to notice is that um, these HKs are now very close to being right invariant. So specifically, if T is in BN, then we can look at what is HK 
minus right translation by T of HK. And uh, what do we see here? Well, we see that there's some finitely many terms, but the finitely many terms we don't care about because they're all in the ideal, right? Alpha N, uh, all these alphas are in the ideal. So the finitely many terms we don't care about. So we only care about uh, the tail of the sequence. And so if we try to estimate this uh, as we go from, um, so this T is in Bn. So if we estimate this as we go from N to infinity, so K uh, equals, uh, so if we take the sum here for M greater than N say, and now we estimate the norm of this. Well, now we have, um, uh, so uh, HK, oh, sorry, just the, the tail end. So we have here the tail end when, when we take the sum over HK. So this is alpha M plus one minus alpha M HKIN minus right translation by T alpha M plus one minus alpha M HKIN. So we have this sum. So this is the tail end of the sum. The first beginning parts we don't care about because they live in the ideal. And this we can just do as sum M greater than or equal to N. And now here we have uh, right, our right translation. Here we have alphas, but we chose the alphas such that uh, we have two. So this is by two. Um, so this is approximately, or it's less than or equal to or approximately equal, and this is by two. We can move the RTs inside. And when we move the RTs inside, so then we get, um, so then we get alpha M plus one minus alpha M, uh, HKIN, M minus right translation by T, uh, H K I M. And then we see by uh, condition uh, one here that these are all individually less than two to the minus M. So this is then, uh, so this is by condition one. So this is less than or equal to up to maybe some epsilon uh, by one. This is less than or equal to two to the minus M, maybe minus one, something like this. Right, so we get this condition. So this is for the tail of the sequence and the beginning of the sequence in the, is in the ideal, which we don't care about. And so as a consequence, we therefore get that when we take the quotient, so HK plus I naught of X, when we take the quotient, this becomes right invariant. And this was true for every ball. So it's gonna be true. So this is then in L infinity of gamma mod I naught of X, right invariant. Uh, and similarly, if we look at, uh, if we look at this sum, so if we look at B and we subtract it from the sum we have here, so similarly, if we look at, and we look at just the tail of this, since again, in the beginning, everything's in the ideal, uh, M greater than or equal to N of alpha M plus one minus alpha M B uh, I M minus, now we have here sum over K. Uh, now we have here alpha M plus one minus alpha M. And then this is times uh, the H I M K minus left translation by T K H I N K. So if we look at this sum, uh, we're gonna have again, the same sort of norm estimates here. So specifically here we have, uh, oh, we should put the L, the left translation outside of the alpha M's, but of course that's not gonna make much of a difference by four. Uh, so I should be precise here and put the alpha M's, alpha M's HK, and then there should be another 
that we should put in here. Alpha m plus one minus alpha m. So they go in there too, but by four, so this is less than approximately equal here. We have four. Um, uh, by four, we can move the alpha t's. We can move this across these alpha m's. Uh, and then what do we have? Then we have by three. And by three, we can see, use the three estimates. So we get that this is again, less than or equal to two to the minus n minus one. Uh, so this means again, in the quotient, we don't see this difference, right? So when we take the quotient, we get therefore um, that this gives us what we want. So the conclusion of all of this is that we get, get then, then that B minus the sum of these, uh, when we look in the quotient, HKs, B minus sum of HK minus left translation TK HK, some here. Um, well, we get that this E minus one minus this is, uh, you know, equal to zero, is equal to zero in the quotient. We have that each of these HKs uh, are equal or right invariant in the quotient. And we have that the distance from B to one is less than one half. So combining all of these, that says that this paradoxical decomposition uh, works for this uh, here, right? So therefore this number has to be within one half of, of one. Uh, so this then finishes the proof. So therefore, sorry for going long. So therefore, there does not exist a left invariant state on L infinity of gamma mod I naught of X right invariant. All right. Uh, so sorry for going long there, and this is a little bit messier than I had hoped, but uh, this is one of these arguments that, again, you sit down and you prepare for, and it seems somewhat natural, uh, but then, you know, it has a lot of technical details, it's a technical argument. Any, any other questions about this? Yes, can I ask a question? Oh, one, one question. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't understand why we can uh, substitute a weak star convergence to norm convergence because I understand why in the case of weak topology and norm topology, but uh, how how to use Han Bonnach argument for uh, so the Han Bonnach? So how I'm using Han Bonnach, and I've used it a few times here, mm -hmm. is that uh, so this is we're using the Han Bonnach separation theorem. Uh, Han Bonnach separation. Uh, which just says that if uh, C is so if we have uh, this is any Banach space, so if C is a convex subset of a Banach space B. Uh, such that, uh, well, and if this is a convex subset, and if X is in B, but is not in the closure of C, so this is the norm closure, so then they can be separated by a linear functional. So then there exists a linear functional, a continuous linear functional, uh, phi in the of B um, and some and some a a real number such that the real part of phi um, of uh, x is less than a 
and the real part of phi restricted to C is greater than or equal to A. Or, or the other way around, or vice versa. So they're separated by a hyperplane. So this is the Hahn-Bonnach separation theorem. Whenever you have a convex set and you have something which is not in the norm closure, then they can separate. There's some hyperplane which separates the set from the point in the closure. So this means that if you have a uh, convex set, so as, as a consequence, hence, if C is uh, convex, so if you have C inside of a Bonnach space, B is convex, and such that zero is in the weak closure. So then you have the zeros in the norm closure. That's just another way of rephrasing the same thing. I mean, that's just contraposition. Yeah. Uh, and so this is how I'm using it uh, over and over again. So if you look at uh, where do we use it, we use it when we have things. So these, this is in L infinity, and it converges weakly to something in the double dual, which turns out to be zero. But the point is, is that these are not in the double dual. These are just in uh, L infinity mod I, I naught. Oh, I see. Thank you. So the GIs converge to the FKs in the double duals, and these converge to these in the double dual. But it happens that the difference is zero in the double dual. So therefore, this sequence in L infinity mod I naught converges weakly to zero. Because of course, the weak star topology in the double dual is the weak topology in, in the original space. Um, so therefore, we can use this Hahn-Banach theorem to say that they converge. There's some convex combination which converges in one. Okay, I understand. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right. Uh, in that case, I will see you guys on.